Welcome back to Sunday Vibes, one and all. We are still in isolation. It's my bad. I've got COVID still. I just can't get rid of it at the moment, but Doogie Critchley and Patrick Van Straten join me. Gents, how are you? Fine. <laughs> apparently, we, apparently, we have to get straight into it today. People want their free content exactly the way they want it. <laughs> yeah. There's been a few comments saying you need to get into your videos quicker. You need to get into Sunday Vibes quicker. Let's chit chat. Well, I'm sorry that we're chit-chatting how are you dudes uh yeah no i'm good thank you um yeah i didn't actually catch the champions league last night because i was playing football myself but i felt very sorry for jack Grealish getting those beautiful locks pulled oh, but otherwise i'm good that game was beautiful mate it was just the epitome I'm of being all over it yeah. it was so good mate um, it was great dudes Let's, <laughs> let's crack on with today's uh, headline question which comes from has who says debate each premier league club's best player this season so i'm hoping we get a little bit fiery here because there are some disagreements in the script i've seen already we're going to go in alphabetical order because we don't want this to drag on forever but we're starting with arsenal and if it's anybody other than martin erdegaard i won't be happy it has to be martin erdegaard does anybody have opposition to martin erdegaard as their suggestion i do i do sir yeah then I think I mean I think Odegaard's been spectacular. I think he's made a mockery of all the people that didn't rate the signing last mm -hmm. summer, the people that wanted James Madison instead of him. I think it's really rare to now find someone on Twitter, which is a very, you know, divisive arena as we know that doesn't rate Martin Odegaard. I think he's been sensational. But I think across the entire season, I'd probably give it to Pakayo Saka. I think he has take, gone on leaps and bounds. He now looks like one of the best wingers in the league, not just Arsenal's best player. Uh, he's got 14 goals and assists, the same as the last two campaigns combined. And he's just the complete right winger. He's got everything to his game. And if Arsenal don't finish in the top four this season, which doesn't look particularly likely at the moment or next season, I think there's going to be major interest from around Europe in Bukayo Saka. Oh. He's got everything to his game. He's now an England star and he's been absolutely sensational so far this season. So whilst I would be happy to give it to Odegaard, I wanted to put forward a case for my man Saka. Ooh, I mean, it's a good case, and he is a sensational player. But Pat, you're the Arsenal fan. I just, I feel like Erdegaard just has the most influence of any player in that side by some distance. Yeah, that's kind of how it feels to me at the moment. Um, I think that Arsenal getting good, which was pretty much around early to mid December, right before that, we were pretty bad. Um, pretty much coincided with Erdegaard really becoming the centerpiece of the side, and his form really starting to accelerate. And he's done it in a couple of positions this season. You know, there have been times where we've been a bit thin in midfield and he's dropped in there and actually has been buzzing around, defending pretty hard. He leads the press really well when he's in the front line. What he's not going to do, like Saka, is kind of create something out of nothing. Saka is much better at doing mm. that. But he's the most influential player on the ball. He's the most influential player off the ball. He looks like a future captain for the side. Um, I think he's got nine goal involvements in the league. And while he's overperforming his XG, he's underperforming his expected assists, or rather his teammates are not finishing the chances he's creating. So I don't know. I, I To me, I just think that there were probably three or four months since December where Uruguay could have been our player of the month. Um, I know Martinelli was one. I think Party was another. But I think he's really, really been driving us on since then. And... While we might be good without him, I don't know if there's anybody in the side who can quite do what he does. Um, I think that they're feasibly could. I think Martinelli and Pepe and, and Smith Rowe could kind of cover for Saka a little bit better. But uh, I mean, look, I don't object to, to Saka being the choice. Like he's He's been yeah. sensational. But I think this season actually has been a bit more of a consolidation season for him. Whereas to me, Odegaard has taken a massive step on since the autumn. Yeah, uh, I'm going Erdegaard as well. I think we'll outvote you just on that one, Dukes. Boom. Erdegaard, two to one. Although, my God, Bukayo Saka, what a baller. Uh, Villa, uh, I'm going to go John McGinn. I'm putting forward John McGinn's case here because I've seen Ooh. in the script that you boys have both disagreed with me here. You've got the same name down. But I think across the course of the season, John McGinn has been Villa's best player. Um, I think he's incredibly influential on and off the ball. Very, very versatile. Um Look, he might not be, I don't know, Champions League, Europa League level, but for Villa, he is exceptional. You know, to be putting up close to five tackles and interceptions for a player like John McGinn, who also progresses yeah. the ball really well, creates chances, it is no mean feat. He's like, 
everything goes through John McGinn. I think he is their best player, um, or has been across the course. He's not necessarily their best player in moments, which is the guy you've picked, I think, who's come in and, and probably changed Villa's fortunes a little bit. But John McGinn, across the course of the season, because it's been a really up and down season for Villa, has been very consistent yet again. Uh, and I think that Villa are very lucky to have him in the side. But I know that you two have gone Coutinho, haven't you? Yeah, I, did, uh, I found this really difficult, actually, with Villa, because... It's been quite a weird season for them. Really inconsistent. You know, haven't really stepped up too much since Gerard's arrival, um, particularly in the last few games as well. And I think there are some cases for other people in their squad. I think Matty Cash has had a reasonably good year. I think Jacob Ramsey has, you know, mm. got himself into England reckoning, which no one saw coming at the start of this year. But I think Coutinho, yeah, he's just been a lot of fun to watch, which in a Villa side that haven't had... Sorry, that haven't had a lot of their forward <laughs> players really excel this year. I think Watkins has slightly underperformed. Ings has slightly underperformed. Leon Bailey struggled with injuries and form at times as well. Coutinho's added a bit of sparkle. And I mean, you know, four goals and three assists in the league so far. He is taking over 50% of his shots from outside the area, which I would like to see drop classic. next year. <laughs> Coutinho. Classic Coutinho, yeah. Very classic Coutinho. But um, yeah, for a, a little redemption arc for him as well, after a really difficult period at Barcelona, I was quite against the signing in January. I thought they should prioritise strengthening that left-sided centre-back role and try and move on Tyron Mings at some stage as well. I know he's got those leadership qualities, but I did think that that was the weakest area of their squad. And I thought that, you know, you should really try and get Emi Buendia up to speed. But actually, Emi Buendia has probably looked a little bit rejuvenated since Coutinho's arrival, as have a lot of those forward players. So in a really difficult season for Villa, to pick out one standout at least, I did angle towards the Brazilian. Yeah, I think it's difficult, isn't it? Because, like, over the last few years, you might have said, you know, Emmy Martinez. I feel like Emmy Martinez has really taken a step backwards this year. Not a good um, season for him, yeah. Yeah, I think the forwards haven't really worked. Ings hasn't quite worked. Watkins has been okay. But, Pat, can you can, can we say the, play, the team's best player of the course of the season can be a player that arrived in January? And then they haven't exactly been, you know, flying up the league since then. I think Steven Gerrard in the Premier League has a worse win rate than Frank Lampard. Yeah, though, I think that that's a, that's a misrepresentation of how good they've been. I think there's a weird narrative going around at the moment of like, have Villa really got better under Gerrard? Yes, they have. They've gone from being a negative XG side to a positive XG side. So they've gone from being on the whole worse than their opponents to being on the whole better than their opponents. That's good. <laughs> like, that'll put you in the top half of the table. Um, and I think there's enough talent here to, to dream quite big on them mm. you know what Watkins is not young but he's in his prime um Bailey's young uh Buendia is young enough like there, there are a bunch of players here who you really can be quite optimistic about going forward um I, I do see your point and I'm more amenable to it given that you said McGinn may not be Champions League or Europa League quality because I do think that he's a really fashionable player to like McGinn mm. he's one of those guys who people just like absolutely rave about and I get it, but I don't think... When people talk about him going to a bigger side, I don't see that, really. I mean, if he was already at a bigger side, that would be fine. But to me, his value is playing this weird hybrid role at Villa where he kind of gets to play on the wing sometimes, but he's not really a winger. He gets to play in central midfield, but he's more progressive than a central midfielder. Um, I really like him there. I think, I think maybe McGinn makes sense, so I'm happy to go with your decision on this. But I suppose I was looking at it as like, who is actually the best player? Yeah. It's it's Coutinho. Yeah. Um, who has been the most important player for Villa? I think McGinn is is a very good shout. Uh, all right, let's do Brentford then, because we've got a three way split on this one, haven't we? We've got a three way split. Pat, Norgard down here, who has been an absolute beast off the ball this season. Yeah, there's basically the other players here that you guys have gone for, one hasn't been there very long. Another has been extremely streaky. Yeah, um, yes. Norgard has been incredibly consistent mm. all season long. Huge defensive numbers, the best defensive numbers in the league. He's got the most tackles and interceptions in the league. He's on like 6.5 a game, which is Ndidi, Ndidi rate. And unlike Ndidi, he isn't limited on the ball. Um, he's really good at completing long passes. I think he's the second best in the squad for that. He's completing a couple of progressive carries a game. So that's obviously driving forward with the ball. I think he leads the team in passes into the final third, leads the team in progressive passes. <laughs> he's just a good all-round midfielder. He's your, I mean, he's your kind of pound shot party or someone. <laughs> it's your, or, or Rodri, you know, that he's that guy. He's the centre of that side. And so I just think Brentford have been a better defensive side than the table makes them look this season. Um, 
when they've been in contention during the tougher stretches of the campaign, Norgard's been more important to that than than someone like Tony or even Mbermo, who I think has underperformed his XG too much to qualify for this, um, for that being, you know, Brentford's best player himself. So I just think that consistency is the thing that's going to keep them in the league and Norgard has been Mr. Consistent for them. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. Dude, you, who have you got for Ericsson? I've gone for Christian Eriksen. I think I might have got mm. slightly wrapped up in the storyline here, lads, to be honest. I, I just think it <laughs> deserves credit to come back from, you know, effectively dying on a pitch in front of, front of the watching world and to return at this level and look comfortably Brentford's best player in the four games he's played and also steer Brentford away from a really sticky patch. They're mm. only one point above Leeds and in 17th when he arrived at the club. They're now 12 points clear of relegation as we shoot this. And I think ericsson has been an enormous part of that. He makes their side so much more complete an attack. They look like they've got so much more to their game now. Tony's not having to drop quite so deep. He's only played four the games he's... though, Dukes. Four games. Yeah, but, I know, but... but Dukes has got a point. If, if, if in those games he gives you four wins and gets you from close to relegation out of relegation, then you could be the most important player of the season, right? Yeah, would I mean, would they have gone down without him? Probably not, but there was still a pretty good chance. Where, will they go down with him? No, absolutely not. Mm. And I think Ericsson's contribution to that should not be underestimated. And if I was going to choose for someone else, I'd go with Pat's suggestion rather than yours, Joe, I'm afraid. Oh, all right. my suggestion is Ivan Tony, uh, who I think obviously got off the season pretty slowly, didn't he? Was not far in all cylinders, but was being asked to play a slightly different role, was asked to play a little bit deeper, move the ball onto Mbomo, who was running off him. It's his first season of Premier League football. He suffered injuries. He suffered COVID. He hasn't had an elite creator in the side or even close to an elite creator in the side supplying him any sort of balls. As soon as he's got a creator alongside him, he can't stop scoring goals. To have 16 goal involvements in a Premier League season, your debut season for Brentford, I think is pretty impressive. I think without his goal output, Brentford would be in massive trouble. Um, so, look, he, I find it dis, I find it hard to disagree with Pat. I think Pat's made a really strong case for Norgard, but I think, like how I, I do want to ask, how high do you think Tony can play his football? He's twenty six now. Like, I feel like he's proven to a level that when he's put alongside a really good level creator, he is going to score an awful lot of goals. Like, yeah. I think how many pens has he got? Ooh, probably a, a fair few. Probably a fair I, few. And it's also worth mentioning that this hot streak recently, right, is somewhat down to getting a hat trick in one game. You know, I mean, it, I know that we don't take take those away from from players over the course of yeah. the season, but to, to be honest with you, I find the whole like how high can this player play is a bit misleading because it really depends you know if they're playing in the right system with a role that is designed around their strengths mm. you know like is is marcus alonso is his quality better than somebody like ivan tony's i'm not really convinced it is <laughs> but if you have the right role for him in the right system he can play on a side that's good enough to win the champions league I right? so i don't know like if tony went to a side where they were going to use his strengths you know use him as that pivot for exciting attacking players around him like if he went to liverpool could Liverpool still be in contention for the league with wide players around him? Yeah, probably. <laughs> I mean, who knows? Patch is dropping Liverpool's name in there for Ivan Tony. He'd be absolutely <laughs> loving that. The guy's been gagging to leave for about six months. That is annoying. I will say that. Like, maybe he can't play at a higher level because he clearly can't handle having a camera put in front of him. He starts behaving like a... Um, so I think he just needs to wind that in a little bit if he wants to play at the highest level. Yeah, all right. Should we, should we settle on Norgard then? Should we, let's settle on Norgard. Because I, I think that's, that's I think that's a, a fair suggestion. Uh, Brighton, you guys hate then. on Ericsson. Brighton, we've got two suggestions that are matching. You boys have gone for the same player. I've gone for a different one. Yeah, I think it's been quite a weird season for Brighton, to be honest. I was expecting mm. slightly more. I think, I'd, I don't know. I know they've never been in danger of relegation, but been quite a flat campaign for them, I would say. Uh, but yeah, Eve Basuma, when he's been on the pitch, has been absolutely excellent once again. And I just don't really get why the main transfer links for him for this summer are Aston Villa. Like, the guy can aim so much higher than that. Like, if someone like Man United wanted to buy two central midfielders this summer, Basuma should definitely be one of them. I mean, I know he's not 
necessarily going to be that out and out sitter that they potentially need, but Basuma alongside someone like Conrad Lehmer with Fred in rotation or, or McTominay in rotation, that's a really solid mid midfield duo. And I think in a Brighton side that has sort of struggled again going forward at times. We've seen some players come in and out of form at different times, like Trossard started the season quite well. Alexis McAllister looked like he was finally adapting to this, this level. There hasn't been too many standouts. Uh, so I think Basuma is, is probably the shout here. Pat, you gone for him as well? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I really like your shout, like when he's on the field, but actually hasn't played that much. Yeah. Basuma's played a lot more than him. Like Webster has, sorry to, you know, spoil Spoiler. 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 We we Webster has got like way under half the minutes available in yeah. the league this season. That that to me is an issue. Yeah, and I, I'll hold my hands up and admit that that is definitely a problem. But I think the drop between him being on the field and not on the field for Brighton is just so astronomical at this stage. This run that they've been going through recently where they've looked all over the place, coinciding with Adam Webster being injured for the last six weeks is absolutely linked hand in hand, in my opinion. I think mm -hmm. when they don't have his ability on the ball to progress the passes, I think he's got the third most progressive pass in the squad. He's an aerial monster, wins everything in terms of ground jewels. There's, there's reasons that he was nearly getting England call-ups this season, I think, Adam Webster. He has been outstanding for Brighton, but is held back by injury problems at times. It, However, it's not as if Basuma's played 31 games or 33 games this season, however far we are into the season now either. He's only had 20 Premier League starts as well, so he's had his injury problems. I think oh, it's, this, is, this is a difficult one. I really like Adam Webster. I think he's been out, outstanding, but I'm happy to buckle because it's gone 2-1 to one to Basuma. I'm happy to buckle to Basuma. Um, should we move to Burnley then? Because I feel oh, like Burnley God. is almost impossible, <laughs> man. Like, I've, I've No put, one. I've put Veghorst down as a bit of a joke, but like I, don't, I guess it's Maxwell Corne if you wanted to go like statistically. But has he actually been that good? It's like oh, no, know. he is not. No. I don't know. I think it's quite difficult to be good in this Burnley side. They've had a really, really, really poor year after years of sort of. You know, performances dropping and dropping. They've got the oldest squad in the Premier League. They've got 10 players out of contract. It's If they go down, it's a potentially really difficult scenario. Will Dyche stay on after all this time? Probably not. He's already got, what, two promotions so far from the Championship. Maxwell Cornet, I still don't know why he's at Burnley. I don't know what his agent was thinking, to be honest. He's a much higher quality player than Burnley. But yeah, seven goals, not too bad. Their top scorer this season. I think the guy you've suggested came in in January, which is kind of my argument for Ericsson as well. Yeah. Maybe he has looked like their best player since he's been there. But Corne across the season, phew, potentially Dwight McNeil as well. I, I, other than that, you're kind of you're kind of lost for options uh, with Burnley right now. And if they go down, they're in major major trouble. It makes the end of this uh, Premier League season so so interesting. And just a quick word on Sean Dyche as well. Left with massive egg on his face after saying Everton had forgotten how to win after beating them last weekend. They then go to lose to Norwich and Burnley, uh, sorry, Everton then beat Man United. So it looks like an absolute idiot right now. <laughs> I mean, it's good, it's, it's good for you, Diggs. Uh, Chelsea, uh, I'm going for Thiago Silva here. I know that there's more obvious shouts, but I just think Thiago Silva at his age to put up the third most minutes in the squad in probably the second best defence in the Premier League. I know that Liverpool, I think, by underlying numbers, it's Chelsea. By real, real numbers, it's Liverpool. But I think that Thiago Silva, complaining about two, complaining about three, has been just frighteningly good on the ball. Um, for me, Thiago Silva has been Chelsea's best player pretty much every time I watch them. But I can understand why Mason Mount's in there. His output has just been frightening. Yeah, I, th I think it's got to be Mason Mount. Like, do I there is a lot of protection there. Like, I understand that Silva's been really, really good, but there's a lot of protection. Mm. And actually, Chelsea's defence, by the underlying numbers, is third best in the league. Like, yeah. that's okay. I mean, it's still a great defence. It's still a great defence. And for Silva to be doing it at 37, that's great. But I don't really believe in saying this guy is amazing when you take into account that he should not be amazing. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, it, like, to me, Mount is just amazing regardless. <clears throat> He's incredible. He's gone from being a guy playing in the championship who was kind of considered uh, a good prospect to being a nailed on starter in one of England's strongest positions 
being the guy who drives on a Chelsea side who have invested a not inconsiderable amount of money in their attack over the last couple of years. Um, plus, he just works his ass off. He's yeah. he's just incredible. I mean, and the way he changed his game when Tuchel came in is is frightening. Um, so, to me, he's. He's the guy you've got to control when you play Chelsea, and he's the guy that I that I fear playing against when I play Chelsea. I'm actually not that bothered about Werner. Havertz has been great later, but I still think that you can deal with him. Mount is a problem for everyone. Yeah, at the burn about midweek, he was just everywhere. Like the little holes yeah. he was picking up, it's just unplayable at times. Yeah, he was ridiculous. I thought Havertz worked exceptionally hard in that game as well and continued, as Pat said, a really good like last six weeks or so. Since Lukaku's gone out of the first team pitcher, Havertz has really stepped up. Quick mention for Rudiger as well. Yeah. I think his the year Definitely. that he's put together with his contract situation hanging over him is really, really impressive. Never let his head drop. Real leader in that team as well, seemingly. And also Mateo Kovacic. I think yeah. he is been Chelsea's best central midfielder this year. I think he's been better than Jorginho by quite some distance and actually better than Kante as well. Um, it's got everything you'd want from a central midfielder. I don't mean a sort of Roy of the Rovers central midfielders like a Steven Gerrard, Frank Lampard. Everyone used to think that mid central midfielders need to score loads of goals and get loads of assists. He's got everything to his game except for that kind of final third cuteness and maybe a little bit of you know finishing prowess. But Kovacic has been sensational this year and deserves a lot of credit. So actually Chelsea, in a bit of a weird season for them, there's quite a few candidates, unlike a lot of the other teams on this list. Yeah, uh, let's go to Palace then, uh, if we're setting on Mason Mount for Chelsea, where there's a lot of candidates. There is actually a lot of candidates this year. Who wants to go first? Well, I think a lot of people will be surprised that none of us put forward Conor Gallagher who I do mm. think has been excellent. It's been kind of his breakout Premier League year, even though he played really well at West Brom last year. I was just thinking actually the other day that mm. even if Colin Gallagher goes back to Chelsea, I really struggle to see him breaking into that first team because he's going to be competing for that Mason Mount style role. And Mason Mount's just a significantly better footballer than him at the moment. So that's one to keep an eye on. But I would probably go Joachim Anderson. I think he's Ooh. been... I think he's been really, really good for Palace this year. Hasn't got as much credit probably as Mark Gehi because people are realising that Chelsea potentially made another Tomori-esque mistake with Gehi and, you know, especially if they signed Kunde for, what, 60, 70 million pounds, if they're allowed to do that this summer. Could they have just kept Tomori or Gehi? Probably. Um, but I think Anderson's been sensational. Only moved for 15 million pounds. Uh, that's 10 million pounds less than they paid for Sacco. Uh, at the time and he's been really progressive with his passing two assists the other day against Arsenal one of which was a great example of what he can bring to the table the sort of that leader in their in their defensive unit uh, and he's just been part of that sort of rejuvenated Palace side that whose numbers have improved so much this year and whose performances are just notably more energetic more exciting to watch and they've just been one of the league's most most feel-good stories, basically, this year. And I think uh, Joachim Anderson has been a massive part of that. And he's also been a regular, unlike the player that you guys are going to mention. Oh, oh, he's, co he's coming for Michael Elise. <laughs> he's coming for Michael Elise. Who Pat. I do love. I think he's excellent. I mean, and me and you love Michael Elise. Well, I think Dukes does as well, but he's got a point. Like, Elise has played pretty limited minutes. He's been coming on late in games. Mm. Um, I think he's made 10 starts in the league. There are 13 players in the squad with more minutes than him. So I do see the argument for Anderson. But Elise, to me, he, it looks like he might be a world beater. I mean, I know it's limited time on the pitch, but he looks special. Mm. Uh, leads the squad and expected goals and assists in the time that he's on the pitch. I think he's got the most progressive passes, the most shot-creating actions, goal-creating actions, uh, passes leading to a shot, progressive carries. When it comes to dribbling into the box with the ball, he's one of the best in the league right now. Yeah. I mean, and look, does it help to come on against tired defences? Yeah, but there are plenty of people at say Man City who do that and who actually don't put up numbers as good as Elise's. Elise just I don't know what it is man there's just there's something so exciting about him I mean he's he's got that incredible balance and speed and change of pace but also like the finesse of the pass and maybe this won't come across as as much of a compliment as I mean it but he reminds me of Callum Hudson-Odoi I think he's got some of the some similar abilities to Hudson-Odoi and I think Hudson-Odoi is quite a special player so I do think Anderson has been very consistent very important to them he and Gay, um Gay even 
have been a, a really important pair at the back. And I do think Conor, uh, Conor Gallagher does deserve some credit, though people talk about Conor Gallagher as being a great midfielder. Conor Gallagher doesn't pass at all. And that's not a criticism. Like, it's the role he's meant to play. But against Arsenal, there was a point, I think at about the 70th minute, he'd attempted eight passes all game. So people assuming he's going to go back to Chelsea and immediately fit into a possession side might be up for a rude awakening. Um, Elise, I think you could dump him in any of the top sides tomorrow and he would not look out of place. Yeah. He, he's, he's a special kid. Yeah, special I agree. Kid. I agree. I think Elise is destined for like elite Champions League level football. Like, Honourable mention as well to Wolf Zaha. I think he's mm. equaled his best ever Premier League return. There's still seven or eight games to go, hasn't he? Uh, still incredibly effective when carrying the ball into the box. I think Conor Gallagher has been really, really good, but just the two Premier League goal involvements in 2022. Um, I think the first half of the season was absolutely unplayable almost. Uh, he's a little step back. A little step back over the last three months, but that's not to say that he's, he's been poor in the last three months. I think no. he's just working out his role and working out his position. Um, and I kind of agree with Pat and you that I'm not sure where he fits in at Chelsea. So there could be there could be the opportunity for somebody to pick up a potential star there in Conor Gallagher next season. Uh, let's move on to Everton then. I think we can fly <laughs> through Everton to a level. It's, there's not much other to talk about than Richarlison, right? Yeah. yeah, not giving the injuries I mean, to DCL. Yeah, terrible season for them. If they go down, real, real issues. I think there's four or five players on over 100 grand per week there, yeah. uh, including Andre Gomez. I mean, whoever gave him that contract <laughs> never needs to work in football ever again. Um, so I don't understand that one bit. I mean, DCL with his injuries. Ben Godfrey's probably not had as good a year as usual. Pickford's actually done okay in goal. Yeah. But again, these are players that are just not going to play in the championship, I don't think. So... Huge pressure on Lampard and Everton over the final few weeks. But yeah, it's got to be Richarlison for me. Yeah. Another name that I I was very close to putting in there was Anthony Gordon. I was, I was kind yes. of torn between That's Richarlison and Anthony Gordon. Um, no. Nah. Yeah, but, uh, you know, let's just move on to Richarlison. Uh, let's go to Leeds. Another one we can kind of fly through because we've all got Rafinha down. I mean, it's just there's nobody else really, is there? Was it no. 10, 10 goals in the league? I mean, he's just been exceptional yet again. If he does get a big move this summer, it's going to be a monster fee. Leicester, we've got lots of disagreement. We've got lots of disagreement at Leicester. Uh, who wants to kick us off? I've got a little bit of only up to do. Um, okay. When Joe initially mentioned this this topic in the WhatsApp group, I thought we were talking about who was Leicester's best player. Forgot to change it when I then subsequently realised it was best player this season. So my shout is Tielemans, who obviously hasn't been Leicester's best player this season uh, but I think it is notable that when he hasn't been at his best Le Leicester have looked a far less effective team I think they've looked pretty for want of a better word like bitty going forward I don't think there's been enough like fluidity to their attack I think their defense has obviously been terrible all year so Tielemans hasn't had his head in the right place and it has been notable uh, for Leicester yeah Pat you got for James Madison, which I was really close to putting. I wanted to put James Madison, but I've seen you put James Madison, so I tried, tried to go for something controversial. <laughs> well, I mean, Leicester have, have had just a pretty poor season as mm. well. I mean, they, they have had injury issues, but they've also been terrible basically all season long. Um, I think Rodgers has done a shocking job this year. Um <laughs> And I don't know, like, I just think they've got a lot of guys right now who we like, but are not really performing. And Madison has got eight goals and five assists. So he's the top contributor in the squad. Um, when I've seen him, I mean, as much as we were saying up top, you know, ask the, the fans who wanted him over Odegaard at Arsenal kind of have a bit of egg on their face. I mean, Madison, when he's paid, has been pretty sensational. Um creating a in ton streets. of big chances big up from uh, a big uh, upgrade from last season and yeah I mean it, it is a little bit streaky but again I think that's kind of down to what you were saying Dukes I think that Leicester have been pretty piecemeal Madison has been one of the guys who's tried to stitch it together mm. um I don't know I guess there are just like no significant weaknesses in Madison's game except his injury record whereas Tielemans I think there are big problems with his game that need to be ironed out by a coach um but if in doubt, go for the guy who's got the most most goals and assists, and that's <laughs> that's kind of what I went for with Madison. Yeah, I was I was I wanted to put Madison as well. I'll be honest with you, but uh, I also wanted to put Kieran Kier Dewsbury Hall down. Yeah. Um, 
But yeah, I was just so I was actually struggling to find statistics to back up my point on Kieran and Drewsbury Hall. Like, I every time I watch him, I think he just looks like a really neat and tidy player, and I think he's been very yeah. consistent. But he t- like nothing massively pops for like statistically. Harvey Barnes, I also wanted to give a shout out to. You know, still carrying the ball into the box like an absolute machine, nearly three times a game. But you know, he's underperformed his expected goals, isn't he? So uh, I'm happy to choose Madison as well. Liverpool. Dukes, I'm not having this from you. I've Dukes, seen your suggestion. Um, he, he's been good, but how can it not be Salah? I know, it probably is Salah. For Salah will probably win Player of the Year. I just wanted to give a shout to Alisson, guys. I think he deserves it. <laughs> I think yeah, Salah's he, the he best does. player in the league, Doogie. I agree, I agree. But I just wanted, you know, Alisson to have his moment in the sun on Sunday Vibes. I think he's been sensational this year. Would Liverpool have won the league without Salah? Probably not. Would they have won the league without Alisson? Probably not as well. I think they are have been almost, I think Salah's been more important, but almost as important to their respective sides. I think Salah has been sensational this year, but has had a significant dip in 2022. Mm. Alisson, unlike last year, where he was sort of uncharacteristically poor. I remember that game against Man City. I think they lost 4-1. I think he made two errors for goals. And before that, we hadn't really seen Alisson make any errors in his Liverpool career. But yeah, he's bounced back spectacularly this year. I think he's making a game-changing save pretty much every single game. Um, not at his best necessarily for that Benfica goal from Yeremchuk last night. Um, but still, excellent year from him. I think he's third for post-shot expected goals. So expected goals saved in the Premier League behind Saar and De Gea. And I just think he deserved a shout out. So before you all lose your heads, I don't think he's been Liverpool's best player necessarily, but I just wanted to give him his moment. Yeah, he is. I mean, he is the best keeper in the world. Yeah, like, I agree. Are... I agree. Especially since Old Black's like turned into butterfingers over the last couple of months. <laughs> but um, I also think Trent deserves a shout out. I think just mm-hmm. yeah. continues to be the best right back in the world. But Mo Salah, man, I mean, we're talking about him as the best player in the world not three months ago. He's still so far clear at the top of the goal scoring charts in the Premier League. Um, it, it has to be ridiculous. It's just, I know that he has taken like a little foot off the gas. It feels almost since AFCON, doesn't it? But I think he's he, tired. Even against Man City, yeah, in the second half, there were moments where he just picked up the ball, flicked it over Cancelo's feet. Like I was just thinking to myself, he's still so dangerous. So mm. I think Mo Salah has to be Liverpool's. Uh, I know that, that ball to Mane as well. Yeah, um, Pat. Any, any, uh, anything to add before we move on to City? No, man. Let's go on. All right, let's go on to Man City then, where we've got three rival suggestions again. I've gone Mares. Pat's gone Cancelo. Duke, you've gone Rodri. Yeah, I think all are great candidates to be honest. I nearly put Foden in there as well. Um, Kevin De Bruyne's also had an excellent period since about December, mm. um, but I think. For consistency across the whole campaign, I'd probably go, and, and minutes played as well, I'd probably go Cancelo or Rodri. But I think Rodri has been, alongside Rice, probably the best sort of defensively-minded midfielder in the Premier League this year. I think the fact he's such a massive physical specimen as well really helps uh, that, that Man City team. He picks up great positions. His passing is always pretty much on point as well. He's very good in the air. Uh, and, he, and he mops up extremely well. And he's a pretty much ever-present. He never gets in, injured as well. Uh, whereas Mares, you know, phenomenal goal scoring season from him. Uh, only got one year remaining on his contract as well, which would be quite mm. interesting alongside Sterling. But yeah, he's been great as well. Cancelo. I mean, these are all phenomenal players. It was difficult to pick, really. Yeah, it's so hard at Man City because players just don't play as many minutes as like, other teams in the league. Like Mares, he yeah. said he started 12 Premier League games. So I was, I, I kind of was on the fence about picking him. I was also going to go Cancelo, but then. You know, he has put up his best, like, goal-scoring season in Premier League history for himself. Like, he's scored some huge goals for them. Um, but you know, has he played enough minutes? I don't know. Even I'm kind of on the fence about my own pick, Mares. Um Pat Cancelo, best... I've, Pat, do you think it's, like, on the fence I am about Cancelo being the best left-back in the world because he's a right-back? Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he's the he's definitely the in the top two right backs in the world. I mean, the, yeah, the he never plays Cancelo, there. I was yeah, I know. I was sort I was sort of prepared coming in for because originally when I wrote the list, it was about you know best player. I was sort of prepared for you guys to both say De Bruyne, and I would have to really defend myself. Um, 
But partially with Cancelo, it's that I just enjoy watching him. I yeah. mean, he's got he's so much more fun than a player in his, his position has a right to be. And I think he can be world class at right back, left back and in central midfield where he obviously actually spends the majority of his time. Um, huge defensive numbers as well, which is really, really rare on a big possession side. Like Rodri doesn't actually put up yeah. huge defensive numbers unless you possession adjust them. Whereas Cancelo's defensive numbers, it's like 4.8 tackles and interceptions a game. That would be good at any team. Yeah, um, But he's fast. doing it at a team that has 60% of the ball. He's got a ton of assists. He's second in the squad for assists with six. And some of his assists have been unbelievable. Mm. Like the passes that this guy can play. He's just... He's just like why I want to watch football, yeah, I, I and I and I also I think that if you did that, you know that old thing of uh, eleven, a team made of this player would be a team yeah. made of that player. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, do, does a is there any player in the league where eleven of them beats a team of eleven Cancelos? I don't know if there is. Yeah, he's just unbelievable. It's a good shout. He's a, he's like a jack of all not. trades. He's a jack of all trades while also being a master of quite a few of them. That's a really rare combination maybe, of things. Maybe eleven Bernardo Silvers actually would have a little bit more in the final third, but yeah, mm, it's difficult to even, argue with that. To I think eleven. I don't know, man. I think eleven Van Dykes. I reckon you could play Van Dyke no. up top and he'd be outrageous. <laughs> I don't think he could create though. Like whereas Casello could do a bit of everything. Um, I don't know. He's just he's just a bit. He's a special player, and I do think that if Cancelo or Rodri had been injured this season, it would have been yeah. a massive problem for Man City. I think if Mares got injured, um, they would just swap in another attacker and be basically yeah. fine. That was going to be my final yeah, I point. I think I think Man City don't win the league, particularly if Rodri's injured. To be honest, because Fernandinho yeah. has been way off his his best level. Obviously, his his career is winding down over the last eighteen months. So I, th I th actually think Rodri's probably the most important player in Man City's team. I Ooh. think that's pretty true. Let's leave that one to the comments. Would you go Cancelo or Rodri? We're disregarding Mares. Uh, I've been shit on there. Uh, <laughs> let's move on to United. Um, I mean, this is really picking through the here, isn't it? Uh, I think for me as a United fan, it's probably been De Gea. Um, but that is classic Man United. When De Gea wins Player of the Year, you know we've had an absolutely horrendous season. And I think he's going to struggle big time under Ten Hag. So I'm not sure what happens to De Gea, but he has probably been our best player this season. What do you boys think? Yeah, I mean, I went De Gea too. Um, yeah, I mean, he's been back to his, his shot-stopping best. I think his distribution yeah. is, is is a major issue, to be honest. Um, but yeah, you can't really fault the effort he's put in this year um, in front of a defence that has been woeful in front of a midfield that continues to be ineffective and in front of a forward line that are just falling out with each other. So... Yeah, it's got to be De Gea for me. Pat? Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, he's kept United insofar as they're in contention for anything. It's kind of down to De Gea. But um, I guess that there are objections to De Gea's game. And I've seen still a lot of criticism from Man United fans of his ability to claim crosses, of his distribution. Whereas I think Bruno, when he plays, he's still amazing. He is. Um, the weaknesses in his game have been there all along. They're there whether he's whether the side's playing well or badly. And he's got, what, nine goals? I think expected assists says he should have eight assists, except that his teammates can't finish. <laughs> um, he's their best attacker. He's their most talented player. I mean, he's just... He he is he's just the best player at the side, and I think he's going to be one of your best players next season. Whereas De Gea, we kind of look at him and we say, "Wow, had one of the best shot stopping seasons that he's ever had. Mm. Had one of the best shot stopping seasons in Europe." Don't know if he's going to be playing in the side next season. I mean, that is a. Uh, I think Quite he pretty damning, will do, but yeah. but it's but to me that's like. It, it, it again comes down to favourites a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. I mean, he he's definitely going to have to play a different role. And um, is he capable of that? I think the fact that he doesn't get picked for Spain behind the likes of Robert Sanchez and David Rea when Luis Enrique is trying to play a slightly more progressive brand of football is pretty mm. damning. So it's going to be interesting to see. But let's move on to Newcastle. I have to say, I think this is Joe Linton. Uh, the turnaround for Joe Linton has just been remarkable under Eddie Howe. Look, he hasn't contributed massively in terms of goals and assists. It's only two goals, one assist. But, I mean, his evolution into this box-to-box -box midfielder is just brilliant. Uh, the Newcastle fans love Joe Linton now. And 12 months ago, he was a laughing stock. 
So I think for me, it's been Joe Linton across the course of the season. I think Alan San Maximan has is the most talented player at, at Newcastle, but you know he has had injury problems himself, and I think at times his output's a little bit all over the place. Um, so I'm going to have to go Joe Linton here. Yeah, I think it's fair enough. I kind of forgot about Joe Linton, to be totally honest. I didn't spend a lot of time thinking <laughs> about Newcastle. I just saw them and went, oh, Alan Max man, obviously. Um, but yeah, as you say, a lot of injuries this year. But I mean, his numbers are still really impressive. I mean, 8.1 progressive carries per 90 is incredible. Like, and, yeah. and, and before Eddie Howe came in, he was really holding that side or at least their attack together. Whereas Joe Linton's been magnificent since changing role, um, which deserves enormous credit. To be honest, I'd be happy with Joe Linton. I think it's probably the right shout. Pat, have a Joe Linton? Yeah. All let's right. Move on. Uh, let's do Norwich then. Me and you, Dukes, we've both gone for Norman. Yeah, I mean, I mentioned him on Sunday Vibes, I think about a month ago, and lots of uh, Norwegian fans said, oh, thanks for spotting him. And then some Norwich fans were like, oh, he hasn't played enough. But I just think on the few occasions that I've watched <laughs> Nor Norwich this season, it's not a situation where I, I run to the TV to turn on a Norwich game. Um, but he's been the best player when I've, when I've watched them, to be honest. Um, he's got excellent, agree, mate. excellent defensive numbers. He's a very strong dribbler as well. Um, and in a side that has been... Pretty terrible throughout this season, really, that showing the gap once again between the Championship and Premier League has probably never been bigger and will be even bigger next year after another COVID-affected financial year. Um, yeah, I think he's probably been the pick. Pat, you got a Timo? Yeah, I mean, I think he's going to get double figures in the league again for this Norwich side, which is insane. Yeah. <laughs> like Norwich are absolutely awful. Um, he's got very little service. Um, their defence is terrible they can't really do anything of any kind and yet Puki is on nine league goals I mean, there's it's just very impressive to me um i don't think he can really play at a higher level to be honest with you but um yeah i just think that that deserves some credit in a really really bad side that Puki every Puki has done his level best to drag them through a horrible campaign again um, he got double figures in the league last time as well, so some credit to him. Yeah, still, you know, I saw a, still egg on my face for that. Sorry, I saw a stat the other day that I thought I'd mention that Norwich were the not in terms of net spend, but in terms of spend, the eleventh biggest spenders in Europe last summer. No what? jokes. That's ridiculous. What did they know. even do? They like they they, they spent get... a lot of money on like they spent a lot of nine million pounds Rashid in different places. Josh yeah, Rashid so and Tiolis and so and yeah. Lise Melu and Jan yeah, whatever his name, that Greek left. Wow. Back. Yikes. Jesus. Uh, let's move on to Southampton, though, because this could cause a bit of debate. We've got three different names down here. I'm going to make a case for Carl Walker-Peters, who I think has been Southampton's standout player across the course of the season a little bit. He's like the Poundland Cancelo, playing as a right-back, <laughs> a, a right-footed left-back, but he's still been sensational, like carrying the ball. I think he's 15th in the league for progressive carries, which is really impressive in the Southampton side that play the way Hassan Huttle plays. Um, you know, we talk about Matty Cash having a good season. Like I think Carl Walker-Peters is putting up double the progressive carries that he is, and he's playing out of his natural role as well. Um, very good defensively. I think he's successful in 60% of his 1v1s. He is an all-round good player. Like, he's progressed so much since he left Tottenham Hotspur. Player right back, players a left back into the England squad. For me, Carl Walker-Peters has been their best player this season. Yeah, I, it's, it's difficult to argue with. I think Carl Walker-Peters has been exceptional. I didn't really see it coming as well. I thought towards the end of his Spurs days, I wasn't really sure how his career was going to I go. Agree. I didn't know whether he was like a top level player. I remember that game, I think it was against Barcelona and Usman Dembele made him look like a right idiot. I know it's really harsh to judge someone on one moment, but I just thought, does this guy have what it takes? So massive, massive credit for him turning it around, getting in the England squad, as you mentioned. I just think across the year, I'm not sure Southampton would have been so safe. I'm not saying they would have gone down, even though I did predict them to go down at the start of the year. So me with egg on my face once again. I don't think they'd be so safe without James Ward-Price, to be honest. Seven goals and four assists. I'm not his biggest fan. I don't think he should be a regular in England's midfield, despite the fact he's probably his game is probably more suited to replacing Jordan Henderson than a lot of the other English midfielders that we've got. Um, but yeah, three direct free kicks this year. Loads of unforgettable moments. And in a really thin Southampton squad, I think he's been very consistent in an attacking area all year. So I'd like to give him a shout. But to be honest, I'd be happy with Pat's suggestion or your suggestion as well. 
Pat, who yeah, have you I've got, got for? I've got Livramento. Oh. Um, to me, Livramento is just, you know, looks absolutely incredible. <laughs> I mean, he's a teenager. He's in his first season in the Premier League. He's playing in a side which asks a lot of its fullbacks, actually. And he's delivering a lot. He's an incredible dribbler. Uh, he's a good passer as well, or a reasonably good passer. He's doing exactly what Hasan Hutl asks of him anyway. And his defensive numbers are excellent too. And actually, I've got the list here of Chelsea's last few academy players of the year from past to present. I've got Solanke, Tomori, Mount, James, Gallagher, Gilmore, and then Livramento. That is an unbelievable roll call <laughs> yeah, of players. So, it is. <laughs> so if you're looking to pilfer an academy, then obviously like get down to Cobham with a net and you can just pick <laughs> yeah. up an absolute superstar. You might just end up with Zach Jalab, though. <laughs> yeah, true. He's yeah, that's true. his way in there. Uh, yeah, he's just... I just think Le Livermento, to be a key player on a side that's going to stay in the division as a teenager um, is amazing. And it's not like he's doing it and we're looking at him and saying, oh, you could be one for the future. We're looking at his numbers and we're like, this is just a good Premier League fullback already. Um, I, th I can't quite believe they got him and he's already been rumoured for... A, uh, for a move to Spurs in the summer. So, I mean, if he were to go to a bigger side, that would be really, really interesting. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about Spurs then. I'm going Son here. Yeah, agreed. Like, I, know that Kane, I know that Kane's had unreal last three, two, three months, but are we, for, dudes, are we forgetting the first four months of the season totally here? No, we're not. And, and it's a very good point. I just think that Spurs would not be in contention to finish in the top four if Harry Kane had not turned up in the way that he has in the last three or four months. I mean, what is it, 15 goals and assists in his last 14 games, crucial moments in pretty much every game since. Probably the most important, I mean, arguably, if this title race goes down to the wire, that win over Man City will probably be the most important moment of the season. And Kane completely ran that game against one of the best teams, if not the best team in Europe, in my opinion. So I think Kane deserves enormous credit. I know it was a really slow start. Son has been more consistent across the campaign, but he probably hasn't had as many star moments. Um, so, yeah, I'm angling towards Kane, but I'd be happy with Son. And I also think Christian Romero has been really impressive in his debut Premier League season as well. Yeah, but definitely. Kane can't... I don't think Kane can run games as effectively without True. good runners around him. And um, what Kane is not going to do against you is just create something out of nothing. Like, don't get me wrong, he's a, he's a good creative player, but he still does need service, whereas Son is the best kind of pace and power player in the league. Um, he's, he's really uncontainable. And if I were playing against Spurs and I could choose for either Son or Kane to be injured, I'd choose for Son to be injured. Um, but I really? do get what I do get what you're saying with Kane. I I totally get it. But Son Son's the second top scorer in the league, man. Yeah. I, he's got 17 goals and six assists. He's been absolutely unbelievable. <laughs> he's an incredible shooter with both feet from range. Yeah. He can beat pretty much anyone for pace and strength. I mean, this is not to do Kane down at all because because putting Son as the best player at any side is, you know, it, it's no shame on anybody coming in second to him. But he's just. I, I I just think Son is frustratingly amazing. Yeah, I think yeah. he's I think he's at eighteen goals and assists for six consecutive seasons or five consecutive Jesus. seasons now. Like, he, he, I I actually I'm gonna put my hat down. I think he might be the best weak footed finisher I've ever seen. Like, yeah. have you have you heard so, of Messi? Yeah, but, but does Messi score that many goals with his right? Yes, Messi. There was a study done a couple of years ago that worked out that Messi's conversion rate with his right foot was as good as most players' conversion rate with their strong foot. There you go. Patch just really? reminded me of one statistic. Okay, but outside I, but of the alien, I know, I know what you mean. Alien, I, know I see you your mean, point. Messi. I think that Son, when he gets onto his weak foot in a one v one, I'm just like, go. Like it is his goal. He's mm. so f clinical with his weak foot. Um, so, dude, you're getting outvoted here. It's two to one. We're going Son. Uh, Watford. I mean, it's, this has got to be Dennis. Has it not got to be Dennis? You know, like nine goals, five assists in the Premier League. You're like in his debut season. I know he's massively overperforming. Mm. And I think when he was in Belgium, it was something like 17 goals across four seasons. So I do think if Watford <laughs> get an offer this summer, they should entertain it. Yeah. But I think he has been like, I mean, they're going down. So it's not like he's been vital because they're going down anyway. But um He's just been their best player, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I agreed with you. Pat, why didn't you go with Emmanuel Dennis? Um, 
really just because I wanted to uh, talk about a couple of other players. I, 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 I think Shao Pedro is really interesting, you know. Um, really young, huge dribble numbers, huge dribble numbers. Really good expected goal and assist numbers as well. They're, they're the same level as, as Saar and Dennis and the best players in the Watford squad, despite being young, despite being in and out of a pretty weak side. There's, there's quite a lot in Pedro's game to like. So he's probably the guy I'd look at as the biggest talent in the team. Um, but I do think, I do think it is Dennis. And, and actually, you know, overperforming XG when we talk about that the reason we talk about that is to say don't expect that this is necessarily going to continue in future right but when a player has overperformed their xg in a season then they deserve credit for that because another way of describing that would be to call it good finishing so um so emmanuel dennis you know he's finished really well this season and he's done he's done actually more than you would expect of him mm. to try and keep watford up um, but yeah, kind of like Joe says, I think it means that right now he's probably significantly overvalued. So if anybody's thinking about spending a fortune on Dennis, I would probably not do it. And if anybody offers Watford a fortune, they should definitely take it. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Let's stick with Dennis for now, though. West Ham, I was tapping Declan Rice. Yep, for um, sure. I mean, do we even need to discuss him? I think it's just like at the point where he's just so good now that there's, yeah. there's not much point. Um, maybe an honourable mention to Zuma. Who has been very, very solid at the back? Um, nah, but injured a lot though. Yeah, but and also the cat incident takes him down in my box <laughs> by a long way. Very true, very true. Uh, and then let's finish with Wolves, where Jose Easy. Sarr has just been insane. Yeah, he's yeah. he's been he's been one of the stories of the season to be honest, because no one really expected it. You know, he'd been at Olympiacos, he'd been at Porto, but he'd always been back up there. I think he was back up to Ica Casir for a couple of years there. Um, but yeah, best post shot expected goals, so expected goals saved in Europe. Uh, with their attack still really struggling this year, which is yeah. something that Bruno Large needs to look at next year. Uh, if you can hear that, I've got a leaf sweeper outside my room, so I'm afraid. Sorry for the background noise, but yeah, their attack definitely needs to improve next year. And Saar has been absolutely instrumental to Wolves getting another really high finish. I don't know where they'll quite end up, probably eighth or ninth. Um, but yeah, massive, massive credit to Jose Sarr. No one saw it coming. And Rui Patrice has also struggled at Roma, which makes it even sweeter. Yeah, that's a bargain of the season, isn't it? I mean, 8 million, 8 million euros, whatever it was for Jose Sarr to come in and have the impact he's had. I don't think anybody saw it coming. And quite how Bruno Larger solves the forward crisis. Uh, I'm not sure. I think they need to buy a striker, but that's a discussion for another day. Uh, Pat, you happy with Jose Sarr? Yeah, I mean, they've basically swapped a keeper for a guy five years younger than him. Uh, and five million quid. Like, I mean, that, how? And of course, they had to get someone Portuguese. They were, they're like Athletic Club. They have to go and get somebody who's Portuguese. Everyone knows that's the rule for Wolves. And they plucked him out of Olympiacos, and he's been the best keeper in Europe um, by saves versus expected goals. So um, yeah, big credit to Jose Sa. All right, so that was our that was our list of one player who's been the best player this season from each Premier League club, right? Uh, if you guys disagree with any of our suggestions or want to add any of your own, let us know in the comments below. Uh, lads, do we want to plug anything before we head off? Yeah, why don't you go check out Football Daily's version of The Chase, which yes. dropped last Saturday uh, with Pat, the Dutch destroyer, as The Chase, or I finished it off yesterday. Joe was one of the contestants. It was really, really fun. A massive credit to Zach and George for bringing it to fruition. Yeah, Pat, anything you want to add? No, absolutely the same thing. Same recommendation. It was really good fun. So uh, go and check that out. Yeah, thanks very much for watching, everybody. See you later. Bye.